I learned how important humor is. Now, that should have been obvious to me since I write comedies for a living. But somehow as a caregiver, I had lost my sense of humor early on. And, and it's strange because in this blended family that I grew up in, of six kids, with step siblings and all, there was always tension at the dinner table. And I would diffuse it by telling jokes. And it worked, and somehow again, I had forgotten to use humor. But I interviewed a health coach, and she said the following to me, research shows that laughing lowers cortisol levels and provokes a relaxation response. Even faking <laughs> or forcing laughter does the same thing. So now, um, Michael's Crohn's. Uh, we were just interviewed for a magazine called The Crohn's Advocate which apparently goes to gastroenterologists around the country. And they asked, how do we use humor with Crohn's? It's not easy. Crohn's is sort of a, for those that have it, it's an embarrassing illness. You have to go to the bathroom a lot. And so when Michael and I got together, you know, he would be embarrassed about how much time he was spending in the bathroom. And he, he had this euphemism. He would say, I have to go have a situation. That's how he referred to going to the bathroom. So I said, well, let's just call the bathroom the situation room. And then we turned on CNN one day, and there was Wolf Blitzer, who show is called the situation room. So now every time we turn on CNN, we go, oh, he's in the bathroom. Um, another example, the woman I interviewed in the book, whose, husband, whose uh, son has autism, he didn't have language for a long time. Getting him to speak was the big challenge. So she said to me, you know, one day we got in an argument and he wrote me a note. And the note said, get a life, mom. And she said, you know, some parents would have gotten angry and said, you know, don't be fresh, that's disrespectful. She said, I laughed because not only did he write a complete sentence and spell every word correctly, but he was using slang. You know, when normally he talked like this very stilted Russian trying to speak English or something. So she used humor in a positive way. <coughs> Linda Dano, the actress that I mentioned, when her husband had stage four lung cancer, she said to him, you know, you're not gonna go around looking like some gray, skinny cancer patient. So I'm Italian, I'm gonna feed you pasta till it's coming out of your ears. And she cooked and she cooked and she cooked. And he got so fat that he couldn't fit into the Armani suit she had picked out, you know, that he would wear in the coffin. So the undertaker had to cut a hole in the back of that suit to, to get it on in, in the coffin. That's Linda. Uh, she's very funny. Um, how to get on a nurse's good side. Now, some of you um, may be interested to hear what I what I learned. When in doubt with a nurse, bake a cake. Um, Michael was in a hospital and uh, he had this grumpy, grumpy nurse. She was very big and tall and we nicknamed her Big Linda. It was Linda. Big Linda just never smiled. And I had this idea that if she just smiled, I don't know, she would give Michael better care or something. She would be happier. So I remember that my friend Lori makes little chocolate cakes at Christmas every year for all the people that have done nice things for her. I thought, I'm going to make Linda a cake, big Linda, a cake. I went home, I bought a, on the way a box of Duncan Hines cake mix, and I baked big Linda in this little chocolate cake. And I brought it into the hospital the next day, all wrapped up, and I said, for you to say thanks for your care and your grouchiness, and um, she looks at the cake and says, does it have nuts in it? And off she goes. And I said, well, I guess there's no, you know, making Big Linda smile. And then a few minutes later, she came back into the room lugging this throne, as I called it. It was like this barca lounger with, you know, the feet go up. And she took out the visitor's chair I'd been sitting on and she put the barca lounger there. And she said, here, sit here. You'll be more comfortable. And I said, Michael, you see that? The cake worked. <laughs> so I have since asked nurses, and I said, and they say, food is good, cake is great, chocolate cake is really good. So I don't know, but it 
worked. I learned that denial is such a waste, particularly when it comes to dealing with an elderly parent, as so many of us are. You know, uh, I interviewed um, the director of memory care in the assisted living facility in Santa Barbara, where I live, and she was telling me, baby boomers, I mean, you guys don't want to face the reality that your relationship with your parents has changed. In many cases, you're the parent now. Get over wishing that your parent could be the way he or she used to be. Um, she gave me a, an example of this daughter who wasn't sure if her dad needed to go into this community. Even though he had somehow gotten the keys to the car and driven it to another state and been brought back by law enforcement, it still didn't occur to this daughter that he needed to move. So Liz, the director of memory care, came to do an at-home evaluation. Now, this man had been a very respected surgeon. I guess his kids were just having trouble seeing him in a different light. But Liz came, and this respected doctor said to her, um, I don't believe you've met my wife. And Liz went with it, and she said, no, I, I, I haven't had the pleasure, knowing that his wife had passed away years before. And he said, well, we're in luck. Here she comes now. And in walked his black cat. And her advice was, don't wait for the black cat moment, because you're already too late. Don't wait till you're in the uh, end of your rope. Don't wait till he's at the end of his rope. Um, move him or her, if that's what you're planning to do, so they can get socialized and acclimated, and it's not such a big deal. The big one that I learned, don't forget, don't postpone, don't cancel your own doctor's appointments. I did, and I, sorry, I, I had a skin cancer on my leg that I didn't deal with, and it became much more complicated than it needed to. I ended up having a hysterectomy, which I may or may not have needed to, had I gone to the doctor. But interestingly, after my big abdominal surgery, guess who was my caregiver? Michael. And he was great. I interviewed him in the book. I said, what's it like going from being a caregiver to a caregiver? And he, he told me, he said, well, first of all, I watched you for 20 years, so I knew kind of what to do and what not to do. But uh, we're going to face this more and more as baby, booming, baby boomer couples get older. I have a friend that had surgery, and she was in one wing of the hospital, and her husband was having a stent put in in another wing. I mean, we're going to be facing this, where both parts of the couple are going to go down. Um, Got to learn how to deal with that. But I want to I want to end with a with a piece of advice about caregiving that I found really interesting. I heard it from two sources, two of my experts. One was the critical care nurse. She said, "Don't forget to touch the patient." Sounds simple. Um, she said, "You'd be surprised how many caregivers sit in that chair and they read the newspaper, they look at their cell phone." And there's a patient over there. Get up, give him a neck rub, a back rub, put some lotion on his hands, comb his hair. Touch the patient. You will feel more connected to him and less like the nurse, and he will feel more connected to you and less like a burden. It's healing the power of touch. Then I interviewed somebody else who said the following. My advice is to touch each other. The power of touch is really going to help you relieve your stress, especially if you're taking care of a spouse. Studies show that touching another human being decreases all those stress hormones. If you're in bed at night, hold hands before going to sleep, or put your leg up against theirs. It'll make you feel more attached to that person instead of feeling that he or she is a burden. So, an example. I ended up having yet another skin cancer surgery on my leg and I had to keep it elevated for a period of time and so Michael was my caregiver yet again. And one day he was out and he tripped 
in a parking lot and fell off the curb, tore ligaments in his ankle, broke a couple of ribs, and sprained his wrist. He walked in from the ER on crutches in a boot, and we just looked at each other and laughed. I, we said, you know, no idea who's taking care of whom at this point. Um, and then at the end of that day, we got into bed and we resumed our ritual, which was no matter what medical thing was going on, we reached under the covers and clasped hands, and we held our hands until we fell asleep. And we do this in spite of and because of caregiving. And so I just would love to urge everybody to pass this advice along, touch the person you're caring for. Thank you.